happy to say. Uh, one element at the top, uh, and then I will look forward to taking your questions. Uh, we'll start with Russia today. And the decision by Russian authorities to add imprisoned opposition figure Alexei Navalny and eight of his allies to the registry of so-called extremists and terrorists is disturbing. Russian authorities already have effectively criminalized one of the country's remaining independent political movements with their earlier designation of Navalny-affiliated organizations as, quote-unquote, extremist. This latest designation represents a new low in Russia's continuing crackdown on independent civil society. We urge Russia to cease the abuse of quote-unquote extremism designations to target nonviolent organizations, to end its repression of Mr. Navalny and his supporters, and to honor its international obligations to respect and ensure human rights and fundamental freedoms. The Russian people, like all people, have the right to speak freely, form peaceful associations to common ends, exercise religious freedom, and have their voices heard through free and fair elections. Mr. Navalny remains imprisoned on politically fabricated grounds. We have been consistently clear about that. We call again for his immediate and unconditional release. With that, happy to take your questions. Thanks. <clears throat> um, I want to start with R Russia, but not with Navalny. Uh, a couple things, but they'll be brief. Uh, one, do you have any timeline now? The White House punted to you guys when they were asked when the written response was going to be sent to uh, uh, sent to Moscow. Do you so what I can tell you, Matt, today is that the response has not yet been transmitted to Moscow, but I can assure you uh, that once the response is sent, uh, we will let you know. So stay tuned. So, and, and, and you'll also be giving it to us as well? So we, will, we will let you know, so stay tuned. Uh -huh. We will let you know All right. on a timely basis. Secondly, yesterday I believe you said something about how over the past course of the past week or 10 days or so uh, in terms of formulating what the response is going to be that you were consulting with NATO allies, European, you know, the partners and allies. And I just wanted to know, is, does, does that include Ukraine? Has, ha, have Ukrainian officials been consulted about what this response is going to be? And are you taking into account their concerns or considerations uh, or in, in the document? Yes and yes. Uh, we have been consulting extensively with our allies and our partners. And of course, uh, when it comes to the latter, la latter category, that includes Ukraine. Uh, we have not only informed them uh, and given them a preview of what will be in this report, uh, but we have actually explicitly solicited their feedback and incorporated uh, that feedback into our report. So there will be no surprises. There will be no surprises for NATO. There will be no surprises for our European allies. Uh, there will be no, no surprises for our Ukrainian partners. And there will be no surprises for us or the Russians either? We have been uh, also very clear with all of you, because you have heard us uh, consistently say, uh, what the areas where diplomacy and dialogue uh, may prove fruitful and viable, uh, and the areas that are just non-starters. You know, I, I take it from your from your questions that there's a perception that uh, that we have been less transparent uh, than, uh, or might be less transparent than uh, the other side, than the Russians in this case. What I would say is that uh, the Russians have held out one criterion, uh, and that is. Uh, their demands when it comes to NATO uh, and open door, and we've been very clear about that. Uh, but uh, we have also been very clear about specific areas, whether it's the placement of offensive missiles, uh, whether it is transparency, uh, whether it is exercises, uh, whether it is uh, broader arms control measures, where if done on a reciprocal basis, uh, there is the potential to enhance collective transatlantic and broader security uh, those are areas where we've been very clear that we're willing to engage in dialogue. We have been uh, consistently transparent uh, with all of you, just as we have conveyed this very clearly and consistently to the Russian Federation. Right. Well, I, there wasn't any implication in my question, but let me just ask this. I mean, is there going to be anything in there that the Russians aren't already aware of that are your positions? You will have to ask the Russians when they uh, see the response. Because it sounds as though there won't be anything in there that's a surprise, which means that it's kind of a, you know, a document that is kind of a dead letter, right? Well, look, if you're pointing to the fact that uh, we have been very clear, both in public uh, and in private, 
uh, with the Russian Federation, with the Russian Federation in the Strategic Stability Dialogue, uh, with the Russian Federation in Secretary Blinken's meeting with his counterpart, Foreign Minister Lavrov, last week, with the Russian Federation in the context of the NATO-Russia Council, with the Re Russian Federation in the context of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. Yes, we have been very clear uh, about the areas where we believe dialogue and diplomacy has the potential uh, to enhance our collective security. We've also been very clear uh, about the areas that for us are just non-starters. Uh, for us, that would be fundamental violations of the founding principles of, uh, of NATO and other uh, foundational uh, security instruments that have protected, enhanced, promoted uh, unprecedented levels of security, stability, prosperity uh, for the past 70 years. Um, so you will have to ask the Russians for their response uh, once they uh, see uh, our written report, but uh, you are correct in, in one regard. We have been very clear and consistent. Uh, about areas where diplomacy and dialogue uh, may be fruitful and areas where we are sincerely and steadfastly uh, interested in engaging in that diplomacy and areas where, for us, it's just non-negotiable. Last one. Um, this morning, one of your colleagues over at the White House uh, on, a, on, a, on a background call said that if it gets down to the point where you're going to impose sanctions, a quote, we'll start at the top of the escalation ladder and stay there. And I'm just wondering, is that a wise thing to do, to start at the very top so that the only thing, the only thing more that you could do would be, to, would be some kind of military action? Let me um, take a step back and, and, and answer that question this way. Um, first, you have heard from us uh, consistently, you've also heard this consistently uh, in the category of things we've been consistent about, uh, that if any Russian forces move across the Ukrainian border, if there's a renewed invasion, yeah. uh, it will be met with a swift, severe, and united response, not only from the United States, uh, but also from uh, our allies uh, and partners. Uh, we have spoken consistently about uh, the fact that that swift, severe, and united response uh, will be unprecedented, that it will entail measures that we intentionally eschewed in the past, uh, including in 2014, uh, when Russia uh, last invaded uh, Ukraine. Uh, but it also will be unprecedented in its approach. Uh, and this is the point that, that you were getting to, Matt. It's the point that one of my colleagues uh, made this morning. Uh, my colleague said that, uh, and you quoted it partially, the gradualism of the past is out, and this time we'll start at the top of the escalation ladder and stay there. Uh, we yeah, my question is this. So if you're at the top of the escalation ladder and something else happens, uh, you don't have any further to climb on the ladder. You either fall off or I guess maybe you jump onto well, the roof Matt, if I, the ladder I, is attached to something. But I don't understand. Is it really, is it smart to start at the, at, at, by, by going all out with nothing left in reserve? I mean, are you saying that whatever you guys, should it become necessary, that whatever you guys will impose in terms of sanctions can't be topped? You, you have to recall... Because if, if they can be, and if there are steps that you're not going to take, then you're not starting at the top of the escalation ladder. A couple points. One, you have to recall what this is about and what's at stake here. Uh, if, if this swift, severe, and united response goes into effect, and let me be clear, we hope it need not have to. Uh, we hope that dialogue and diplomacy can help us find a way out of this, help us find a way to de-escalation and ultimately to a peaceful resolution uh, of this Russian aggression. Uh, but if we get there, what we will be talking about is renewed a renewed Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the stakes of that, as we talked about yesterday, are important in the context of Ukraine, of course, uh, a close partner uh, of the United States, a sovereign, independent country uh, it itself. Uh, and that, of course, is important to us. It's important um, beyond Ukraine as well. The what should be inviolable rules of the rules-based international order uh, would come under assault. They would be undermined. Uh, they would be potentially eroded if the international community were not to take drastic steps to show Vladimir Putin, to show the Russian Federation that this is not the kind of action uh, that can be tolerated in the 21st century. These are the kinds of actions that uh, we sought to relegate to the dustbin of history after the Second World War. Uh, and if Vladimir Putin thinks that uh, he renewed aggression won't be met with uh, severe, 
swift, united response, uh, he, he would be wrong. Uh, there's, there's another point uh, here that uh, I, I think is important, though. Um, even, in the, even in the current phase, even in recent weeks, uh, we have seen financial markets uh, price in a greater risk premium uh, into Russian financial assets uh, amid the increasing movement of troops. Uh, it is not just us that is warning of this swift, severe, and united response. Uh, financial markets, private sector actors uh, are taking note. Uh, the Russian ruble recently hit its weakest level in over a year uh, versus the dollar. Uh, and it's the worst performing emerging market currency so far this year. Uh, Russian sovereign borrowing costs in terms of the 10-year uh, bonds, they have increased to their highest levels since 2016. Uh, Russia's stock market has sunk to its lowest levels in a year. But the other point, and, and market participants know this, is that what we're seeing now is nothing compared uh, to what would befall the Russian Federation, the Russian economy, if Russia's evasion, invasion were to go forward. To, to your point, Matt, I just want to be clear about this. This is not about, this is not about, um, this is not about punishment. Uh, this is right now about deterrence. Uh, we are seeking to do everything we can in the, after, in, in the, in the prelude to what could be uh, additional Russian aggression to deter a further Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that is why it behooves us to be crystal clear with um, the Russian Federation, with Vladimir Putin, uh, about the severe costs and consequences that would befall him, that would befall his country if he were to go forward with this. It doesn't do us any good uh, to pull punches, uh, to um, be ambiguous, uh, to be obscure in terms of what we're talking about. And for more than two months now, uh, we've tried to be very clear about that. Andrea. A couple of things. Francis Macron said today that he will be talking to Vladimir Putin on Friday. Is that helpful? Uh, does that undercut the U.S. Lavrov talks or any talks at, at a higher level, you know, where mixed messages could be conveyed? Um, Germany, to my knowledge, based on what German officials are saying, have not yet authorized the Estonian transfer of artillery. Is the delay in making that decision tantamount to banning by not getting it there potentially? Tantamount is, to? Is that tantamount to not approving it I because think. of the delay? Mm -hmm. um, and the Ukrainians, you know, are saying, you know, Zelensky said to his people, uh, nothing is imminent, you can sleep, don't pack your bags, don't worry. Uh, how does that, you know, how do you synchronize that with the warnings from the White House that an invasion could be imminent, could come at any time? You know, is there a disconnect between us and the Ukrainian government in terms of our approach? There are reports, in fact, from the ground that Ukrainians feel left out of the diplomacy despite all of your, you know, the, pres the Secretary's visit last week and all of your arguments that nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Let me try and take those uh, in order. First, on um, the, the French uh, proposal to engage in dialogue and diplomacy with the Russian Federation. Uh, I would remind everyone precisely what we heard from NATO, from the OSCE, from our European allies. Uh, they're very positive, very warm reaction to the fact that the United States, in full consultation with NATO, with the OSCE, uh, with our European allies, uh, with the Ukrainians, uh, as of a couple weeks ago, uh, planned to sit down uh, in the context of the strate strategic stability dialogue, the engagement that our Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, led uh, in Geneva. They have been very supportive uh, of our bilateral engagements uh, with, uh, now more recently, Foreign Minister Lavrov. And they've been supportive for, I would say, primarily one reason. And that one reason is the fact that we have done all of this in full coordination, in full consultation with them. And, but and that said, just to that point, just this week, Macron said that the EU should have its own conversations with Russia. And, and uh, just as our partners and allies have welcomed 
are coordinated, consultative engagements with the Russian Federation, we would certainly welcome dialogue and diplomacy uh, that could serve to de-escalate, uh, in which the Russian Federation enga engages in good faith. Uh, we would be behind anything uh, that would serve to uh, de-escalate tensions in a genuine way. Uh, that is precisely why we have uh, engaged uh, multilaterally and also bilaterally, again, in full consultation and coordination with our partners and allies, uh, with uh, the Russian Federation. There are two paths. You've heard us say this before. There's the path of diplomacy and dialogue. Uh, there's the path of defense and deterrence. Uh, we are pursuing both paths simultaneously, uh, knowing that we have to be ready for either decision that Vladimir Putin makes uh, if, and we know, uh, the fact that our uh, allies and partners are engaged in diplomacy and dialogue, to us, that's a good thing. Uh, but it is incumbent in all of this on the Russian Federation uh, to take steps to demonstrate that dialogue and diplomacy are viable, uh, that they are a means to an end. This is not talking for the sake of talking. Uh, this is talking, sitting down in a principled, clear-eyed way in an effort to de-escalate tensions and peacefully resolve uh, what the Russian Federation has needlessly provoked. Uh, we're engaged in that. Our allies and partners are engaged in that. We're engaged in that together, multilaterally, through NATO and the OSCE. Uh, when it comes to uh, our German allies, we talked a bit about this yesterday. Um, we were in Berlin uh, last week, and the Secretary had an opportunity to speak to Chancellor Schultz, had an opportunity to uh, meet with uh, Foreign Minister Baerbach, uh, the foreign minister uh, was asked uh, almost precisely this very question, standing next to Secretary Blinken, uh, and she spoke in detailed terms uh, about uh, the important forms of support uh, that our German allies are showing uh, to our Ukrainian partners. And I say our because uh, they are uh, close partners of both the United States and Germany, not to mention uh, all of the NATO allies. Uh, so different allies are contributing different elements uh, to this effort to uh, reassure, to reinforce, to deter uh, further Russian uh, aggression. The key is that all of these forms of support are reinforcing. Uh, so whether it is the fact that the United States, for our part, has provided more than $650 million in security assistance in the last year, the, mo the more than in any previous year uh, in history, uh, whether it is the fact that Secretary Blinken himself has expedited and authorized uh, the third country transfers that uh, you have spoken to, uh, whether it is uh, the reinforcements that uh, my colleague at the Pentagon has spoken to uh, in, in recent days. We are making important contributions, not only to um, the defensive security needs of Ukraine, but also to the reassurance efforts uh, when it comes to NATO's so-called Eastern flank. Uh, our allies are very much doing the same. Uh, different allies are contributing in different ways in a way that is mutually reinforcing. And then finally, your question about uh, what we're hearing from our Ukrainian partners. Look, I would make the point that uh, now is not the time for panic, now is the time for preparation. Uh, that is precisely uh, what we're doing. We have been clear about our concerns. We have been clear about the depth of those concerns. Uh, we, you all know why, you all know our reasoning. Uh, that reasoning is, is, is clear, given what we're seeing on uh, Ukraine's borders, what we're seeing in what should be an independent sovereign country of Belarus, with the Russian military buildup there, uh, what we're seeing with preparations for potential hi hybrid operations. All of this is cause for concern, uh, but certainly no one is calling for panic. But just, just to follow up, because precisely I didn't get an answer on Germany, different countries participate in different ways. Uh, is it helpful if Germany prevents Estonia from helping to arm Ukraine? Or does it undermine the unity of the alliance? The alliance is united. <laughs> there is no question uh, about this. The alliance is united. You have heard this uh, in the form of communiques and statements from the alliance yeah, itself. You don't have to. You don't have why, to take my but, word for but it. But why would Germany stop artillery from going to Ukraine? Countries from, have, a, from a third country. Countries have different authorities, uh, different um, uh, different norms, different traditions. Uh, this country, what I can speak to, is what we're doing. Uh, and what we are doing is providing unpre unprecedented levels of defensive security assistance uh, to our Ukrainian partners in a way that uh, we've, we've done in the past, just on a scale uh, that is unprecedented. Did the uh, U.S. object 
to the to them not to them imposing this ban if they do if they do has the US asked them to not interfere we have had in-depth conversations uh, with all of our NATO allies uh, about the deterrent measures that uh, we are prepared to take about the response the swift severe united response uh, that we are prepared to take our NATO allies know precisely what we are doing um, the steps that you've just many of the steps you've just heard me detail uh, in terms of our provision of defensive security assistance to Ukraine in terms of uh, the reinforcements that we are making and prepared to make uh, to NATO's uh, eastern flank. Different NATO allies are contributing in different uh, and meaningful ways. Uh, Francesca. Thank you. Just to follow up on Andrew's question on um, Macron's um, engagement, uh, you, you're saying that everything you've done was made uh, in coordination with uh, your partners and allies. Would you say that um, Macron talking with Putin is done in coordination with the U.S.? Look, the level of coordination between uh, our French allies uh, and the United States has been excellent. Uh, I think our French allies would, would say the same. Uh, as you know, they're even in recent hours have been very high level uh, discussions. Uh, so this conversations, this, these uh, consultations uh, have been uh, constant and, and consistent. Uh, so we feel that we have uh, a good sense uh, of what the alliance, what our allies uh, are doing, and we we know uh, that we've been fully transparent with our allies and partners. So and just the coordination so and communication was better than it was over AUKUS. <laughs> was that a, was that a question or was that a a, a, a jive? Uh, just a, a, a quick one uh, on the, the the president said during his press conference he kind of acknowledged that um, Ukraine is not going. It's not very likely that Ukraine is going to join NATO in the next upcoming years. Uh, are, is this an acknowledgement you're ready to put in written, in your written response, uh, just saying we don't shut the doors, but uh, it's not likely that Ukraine is going to join in, in the upcoming future? Francesca, we've uh, consistently made the point uh, when we talk about the foundational, inviolable principles, uh, one of them when it comes to European security uh, is the right of sovereign nations to choose their partnerships and alliances in any way uh, that they see fit. Uh, it is written into NATO's charter uh, that countries can aspire to join the alliance. Of course, uh, there are a set of membership you. requirements. Uh, those membership requirements uh, are clearly spelled out, clearly delineated. Uh, it is the obligation and responsibility of each aspirant country uh, to be in a position to fulfill those requirements. Uh, but NATO's door uh, must always remain open to those aspirant countries that fulfill those requirements. That wasn't my question. My question is, are you ready to take the quote from President Biden in his press conference? The likelihood that Ukraine is going to join NATO in the near term is not very likely. Are you ready to take that quote and put it in written in your written response? An open door is an open door. That door will always be open. We're not going to take any move. We're not going to say anything uh, that would... The president uh, just did. We, I, I don't. I don't think the president did. I think no, the he, the, I mean, the, 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 the the president said exactly what I reiterated just now, uh, that NATO accession is predicated on uh, a set of requirements that each aspir aspirant country must fulfill. Cut it. Um, just because we're focused on this written response right now, um, I know you aren't going to preview exactly, you know, what this is going to say, but for our expectation purposes, will this written response speak in broad terms that you have already made very public about the ideas that the U.S. sees for the U.S. and Russia potentially working together on strategic you know, stability and the like, or will it have specific ideas, specific proposals that are on the table for negotiation's sake? I think the answer to that is both. Uh, we've been very clear about the areas uh, in which there may be some uh, utility uh, and where progress can achieve, be achieved uh, when it comes to enhancing transatlantic security, when it comes to enhancing uh, collective security, when it comes to addressing uh, some of the concerns uh, that Russia has put forward. Uh, and so in the discussions with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and the discussions with uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Ryabkov and the discussions uh, at NATO and the discussions with the OSCE, uh, there have been uh, broad, high-level discussions about various principles, including uh, the principle we've just discussed here, 
Uh, but then there have also been uh, more tactical discussions, uh, discussions about um, the placement of missiles, uh, discussions about uh, reciprocal steps steps vis-a-vis -vis, uh, exercises, about confidence building measures, about transparency, uh, about broader arms control. Uh, so the universe in which we can engage diplomatically, or at least uh, in which we can engage diplomatically uh, and potentially achieve some progress, uh, we've outlined uh, what that universe looks like. Uh, the Russians know that. Uh, we've done that uh, together with our allies and partners, uh, and the written response will do that as well. Sorry, just so when you say you've outlined that, right? So are we expecting that there should be uh, a bit more filled into that outline in this written response than we have seen publicly? Uh, the what the written response will reflect uh, is uh, what we have said, and that is the fact that there are certain areas uh, that for us are non-starters, uh, and there are other areas uh, where dialogue and diplomacy has the potential to enhance uh, collective transatlantic security and uh, also account for some of the concerns that that Russia has made. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of a, a report that a written response that uh, we haven't formally transmitted yet. Um, but again, we have been entirely uh, clear uh, about what those universes are, where that Venn diagram of Russia's stated concerns, our stated concerns, the concerns of NATO, of our European allies, of our Ukrainian partners. Uh, we've been clear that uh, there is uh, an overlapping element uh, of that Venn diagram. And that's what we're talking about here in terms of pursuing dialogue uh, and diplomacy on the path towards uh, de-escalation and hopefully a peaceful resolution uh, of this needless uh, Russian aggression. Uh, that is a proposition we're prepared to continue to test. Uh, we'll have to see what, uh, how the Russians respond, what the next steps might be, um, but the next step will be transmitting uh, that response to the Russian Federation. Yes. Thank you. Just to be clear, your answer to Francesco was no. You will not be including a um, a characterization of the likelihood or not of Ukraine joining NATO. You well, said open doors and open doors and open door. And so, I would say a couple things. Um, one, an open door is an open door. Uh, two, uh, our response to the Russian Federation uh, was drafted and 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 is being drafted uh, in full consultation and coordination and transparency with our uh, European allies and and Ukrainian partners, but. It is uh, a U.S. response. So uh, it is not for the United States to speak to NATO's posture uh, in any written response that we put forward. Uh, okay. So I think for a couple reasons, uh, that is not the kind of thing I would expect to see in any written response from the United States. Okay, when you talk about it not yet being transmitted, are you also saying it's not yet fully drafted, even though, because you keep saying that you're consulting still, even though you also are saying that it's everything we already know and have said, so you are still drafting. As it, well as not having I, I don't want to characterize its, its state of completion. I will say that um, uh, you know, Secretary Blinken was clear that it will be transmitted this week. Uh, so I would just say stay tuned. Just response, uh, it will be a U.S. government response. Okay. I just well, wanted to ask, uh, you and your colleagues sometimes talk about diplomacy and dialogue on the one side, defense and deterrence on the other. But and, you know, with President Putin kind of deciding in the middle, like, like some kind of magic eight ball or something. But we're seeing signs on the ground, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the MOEX stock exchange, the ruble weakness, you know, we've seen troops going into Belarus, uh, we've seen NATO directing troops toward its eastern flank. D does that mean that, that the scope for diplomacy has, has narrowed? What it means is that we haven't seen the de-escalation that is necessary uh, if diplomacy and dialogue is to prove successful. Uh, we've been very clear that, uh, as we always are, uh, that uh, there is not a precondition uh, for dialogue uh, and diplomacy, uh, but there is a precondition uh, for that dialogue and diplomacy uh, moving in the right direction uh, and moving towards the end state that we hope to see, and that precondition is de-escalation. Is it uh, moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? I mean, things rarely stand still in this world. Well, uh, I, I, I don't think that we've seen any concrete indications uh, of de-escalation just yet. Yes. Anything else on Russia, Ukraine? Uh, sure. Uh, yes. Um, you were talking about the unity among allies. Um, I wonder if you wanted to respond to the 
Croatia, Croatian president uh, Milanovic, uh, who said Croatia would in no way be involved in this crisis if it's escalated, and they will, you know, he specifically said he will recall Croatian troops uh, from NATO um, deployment. So, you know, what, is there is there real uh, unity among your allies on this? I think uh, you have seen the unity that has been expressed uh, in formal statements uh, from NATO, from the G7, uh, from uh, the uh, OSCE, from uh, the European Commission, uh, that speaks to uh, the unity that we have forged, uh, not in recent days, but really in, in over the past couple months. This is something that we have been hard at work at uh, since we first started speaking to this in early November, if I recall. Uh, this is something that, as our, uh, as the information picture has uh, developed, uh, we have consistently shared information uh, with allies and partners. We have engaged uh, with our allies and partners uh, in any number of fora, uh, both in person, whether it was last month at the G7, uh, whether it was uh, at the NATO ministerial, whether it was at the OSCE. Uh, we have done so uh, over the phone uh, as well, video conferences, uh, well over 100 engagements. Uh, as of earlier this month with our uh, European allies uh, and our partners as well, of course, uh, including Ukraine. Uh, and that extends to uh, last week when we were again in Kiev. Uh, we had an opportunity to meet with President Zelensky, had an opportunity to meet with Foreign Minister Kuleba. Uh, and that engagement has continued since. Of course, the Secretary has had an opportunity to speak to the Foreign Minister after uh, his meeting with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, to back brief him uh, on that engagement because, again, uh, we are operating with the core principle in mind, and that is nothing about without, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, about Europe without Europe, about NATO without NATO. But specifically on Croatia, you know, are you concerned that countries are signing up to formal statements when, and then on the other side making these kind of comments that they, they don't actually support this? What, what I can point to are the formal statements that NATO allies have signed so you're up. You're not concerned at all that, that, that if, if the commander in chief of a country is then saying something completely opposed to what they've signed, supposedly signed up for. Uh, documents are um, a physical manifestation of the commitments that uh, uh, that the allies have made. And uh, I, I can point you to those documents. And if it comes to you know, uh, John Finer, um, Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer, said that NATO will make decisions about possible troop movements. You know, he talks about there's no. Um, daylight on the sanctions response, but what about on potentially deploying uh, NATO troops? You know, are you concerned that there isn't the same level of unity, perhaps, uh, when it comes to that military aspect on the eastern flank, not Ukraine? Well, the alliance has been very clear, just as uh, the United States has been very clear, uh, about our commitment to uh, reassure, to reinforce uh, the eastern flank, certainly uh, if there is renewed aggression, uh, if there is a military invasion. But as you heard us say yesterday, uh, we've never said that, uh, even in the absence of that, we wouldn't take prudent steps uh, to uh, provide that reinforcement and reassurance. Uh, but I will leave it to the NATO Alliance to uh, speak to the specifics of those plans. Uh, Joel. A couple of questions on both the diplomatic and, and deterrence piece. Um, the, the Baltic states, of course, announced last week that they will be providing anti-armor and anti-aircraft weapons, um, and Secretary Blinken emphasized that he approved this. Um, do you think that's an adequate upgrade of Ukraine's anti-aircraft defenses, or are you considering any other more substantial reinforcements? Well, uh, what you're referring to um, is part and parcel uh, of a much larger effort on the part of uh, various countries uh, around the world, including many in the, in the NATO alliance, uh, to provide additional defensive uh, security assistance to Ukraine. Uh, you've heard me say this already today, but for our part, uh, the United States has uh, provided more than $650 million in the last year in defensive uh, security assistance, more so than any uh, previous year. Uh, the $200 million in additional security assistance that was approved last month, I believe the second delivery of which uh, arrived uh, overnight in Kiev. Uh, so you can speak to what uh, our, Bar all, our Baltic allies are doing. You can speak to what other European allies are doing. You can speak to what the United States is doing. And the totality of that uh, is, should send uh, a clear signal to the Russian Federation or any other aggressor uh, that Ukraine's partners, 
uh, are uh, providing and prepared to provide uh, Ukraine with what it needs to defend itself. Right. I just I've, I've heard questions. Should that should we expect more stingers to go to Ukraine than this than the batch announced, and or or even Patriots? Uh, any anything to uh, obviously there's an imbalance of air you know Russian air capability. So what I would say is that the second installment, I believe, of that uh, of the deliveries associated with the 200 million that was approved last month in December uh, by President Biden, uh, those deliveries will continue in the coming days and coming weeks. You saw. Uh, that there were uh, pictures and imagery uh, broadcast of that delivery uh, overnight, and I expect you'll um, be hearing more about subsequent deliveries of defensive uh, security assistance uh, in the days and weeks to come. We've provided some details uh, of that. I believe uh, last weekend we spoke to 200,000 pounds uh, of ammunition uh, that was provided to our Ukrainian partners, uh, but we're, of course, not detailing uh, all elements of that defensive security assistance we're providing. Uh, on the diplomatic side, um, you know, the, the French have talked about sort of reviving the Normandy format or, or, or uh, to some extent. Um, do you see the implementation of Minsk II as a diplomatic off-ramp from this this threat of new of, of a new invasion, um, and would that require Ukraine to uh, to move towards st some kind of special status for Donbas uh, before a, a recovering control of its border there? Minsk is an important uh, roadmap. It's an important ingredient. Uh, we see full implementation of the Minsk Accords. Uh, as an important uh, uh, way forward. Uh, it's also a fact that uh, there's one country uh, that has uh, been the primary violator uh, of the Minsk agreements, uh, and that one country is Russia. Uh, you heard Secretary Blinken in the OSCE uh, in Stockholm last month uh, delineate, almost line by line, uh, the various elements of those uh, agreements that the Russian Federation has not lived up to. Uh, and all of our engagements uh, with Russia uh, the United States, our NATO allies, uh, we have made clear the importance of full implementation uh, of the Minsk agreements. Uh, and again, there is one uh, core violator uh, of those agreements. Yes. Uh, so your Pentagon uh, counterpart said yesterday that the U.S. is ready to send uh, more capabilities to the eastern flank countries independently of NATO uh, if they need it. So he said that. And well, these countries have been pretty open about uh, their desire for an increased U.S. presence. So does that mean that it's basically a done deal? And when might we expect a decision? And uh, second, uh, if I may, uh, the Belarusian uh, dictator um, <coughs> Alexander Lukashenko felt necessary uh, recently to stress that he will not allow any occupation of Belarus, presumably by the Russian forces that are coming, which of course, uh, you know, uh, prompted concerns that this is in fact what might happen. Um, and there have been concerns about that. Uh, are you concerned about uh, such a scenario of Russian forces occupying, basically occupying Belarus? Uh, so to start with your first question, I know my Pentagon uh, counterpart and uh, predecessor has spoken to this in, in recent days. He's spoken to uh, the number of service members at a heightened state uh, of readiness uh, and contextualize uh, the fact that this order will ensure um, that they are a heightened uh, preparedness to deploy and provide uh, support uh, should they be called upon. Uh, but he was also clear uh, that they have not uh, been activated uh, for uh, deployments. These are the types of decisions uh, that will uh, be made as an alliance, uh, as uh, the, the full uh, NATO alliance. So I would defer to uh, my Pentagon counterpart uh, and to NATO uh, oh, to speak to the next steps. So might, if, uh, he also said that he, uh, the U.S. might send uh, uh, additional capabilities independently of, of that uh, NATO response force uh, if, if, the, if there's a need. Uh, and he said that he would the U.S. is open to, to provide that. So is that, I mean, uh, Baltic states and, and Poland have been pretty open that they, they want this increased presence. I, I will leave it to my Pentagon counterpart okay. uh, to speak to uh, potential uh, uh, deployment of service members. They've, they've spoken extensively to this uh, yesterday and in, in recent days. When it comes to uh, Belarus, we have been um, uh, clearly voicing our concerns uh, with the military buildup in what should be an independent, sovereign country. Uh, Rus Russia's 
uh, surging of troops into Belarus um, is a cause for, for deep concern. The, that surge, as I alluded to a moment ago, uh, threatens Belarus's sovereignty, uh, it undermines its status in some ways as an independent country. Uh, we also know that Belarus has been an increasingly destabilizing actor in the region. You need look no further uh, than uh, the Lukashenko regime's attempts to cruelly uh, weaponize the flow of uh, innocent migrants, the migrant crisis that the regime orchestrated. And the other point I would make is that just as we've been clear with the Russian Federation about the severe costs that would uh, befall them were this to move forward. Uh, in recent days, we've also made clear to Belarus that if it allows its territory to be used for an attack on Ukraine, it would face a swift and decisive response uh, from the United States uh, and our allies uh, and partners. Uh, we would, if an invasion were to proceed from uh, Belarus, if uh, Russian troops were to permanently station uh, on their territory, uh, NATO could well uh, have to reassess our own force posture in the countries that border Belarus. Uh, but to your question, uh, the permission structure that the Lukashenko regime has provided to Vladimir Putin to station a, a large number of Russian troops on what should be sovereign Belarusian soil, that is an affront to Belarus's sovereignty. Uh, it is uh, another indication that this is a regime uh, that has little regard for its own people, uh, little regard for uh, the state, uh, and the most regard uh, for the survival, the welfare of the regime itself. Uh, one, one more question on Russia, Ukraine. Sure. Uh, yes. So the US has an indication that Russia will refrain from invading Ukraine during the Beijing Olympic, which is February 4 to 20th. One would argue that why would Russian President Putin want to upset Chinese President Xi Jinping at a time when they knew each other much more than in 2008? That's, that's a question that is better posed to Vladimir Putin. Uh, it is not up to us uh, to try to divine, try to uh, predict uh, what he may or may not do. Uh, it is, however, uh, a simple historical fact, uh, as Secretary Blinken alluded to, uh, a couple days ago, uh, that a previous uh, Summer Olympic Games, I was, it was, if I recall, uh, did not prevent uh, Vladimir Putin from going into uh, another independent country. So uh, I think all that says, you'll have to ask uh, Vladimir Putin. One would argue, because in 2008, uh, Chinese leader Hu Jintao has a different relationship with the Putin, and now is uh, Xi Jinping is in power, he has a different relationship with the Putin, and that many things have changed. So would you, you just said that it's not a time to panic. Is there any indication um, diplomacy will fa prevail during that period of time? Is there any indication that? That um, Russia will refrain from further military escalation. That's a question you'd have to, you'd have to pose to Russia. Yes. Uh, yesterday you started, you opened up the uh, briefing condemning the Houthis attack on UAE and Saudi Arabia. Um, and you said that putting him back on the terror list is under review. Can you just explain to us what does under review mean? It's just like you want to see them more engaged in the terrorist attack? Is it a legal issue? Um, what does it mean? And some reports indicating that both the Pentagon and the CIA are actually um, agreeing that they should be put back on the terror list because they threat international water, world economy, etc. So what does under review means? Under review just means that it's something that we are taking a close look at internally uh, within the U.S. government uh, to determine what would best uh, serve our national security interests, what would best serve our desire uh, to uh, be a partner to uh, Saudi Arabia, to the UAE, uh, to other countries uh, that are threatened uh, by uh, these Houthi attacks. Um, what would also uh, allow us to best serve our interest in bringing an end uh, to this civil war in Yemen that has not only wrought horrific violence and instability across the country, but has led to uh, a humanitarian catastrophe. If I recall, there are more than 16 million Yemenis uh, who are uh, suffering from food insecurity. 
Uh, and so we're taking uh, all of this and more into account uh, as we determine uh, the next best steps. Um, we will continue to work with our allies and partners in the region, uh, especially, uh, to promote accountability for the Houthis, for those Houthi leaders uh, that have been behind these terrorist attacks. Uh, we have uh, done this uh, in recent weeks, in recent months, using a variety of tools, uh, including uh, sanctions. I uh, would venture to guess you will see uh, additional uh, steps on our part to hold to account uh, those Houthi leaders who are responsible for uh, these reprehensible attacks. As I said yesterday, uh, we're not going to relent in designating uh, Houthi leaders and entities involved in military offensives that threaten civilians, uh, that uh, threaten regional stability, uh, that perpetuate the, con the conflict, uh, those who are responsible for some of the human rights abuses or the violations of international humanitarian law, uh, or that exacerbate the humanitarian crisis. When you talk about the humanitarian crisis, uh, there is one actor that is primarily responsible for the suffering uh, of the Yemeni people, the widespread suffering of the Yemeni people. Uh, and that is, that is the Houthis. Uh, so we are using uh, every appropriate tool, and we will continue to use every appropriate tool uh, to hold the Houthis uh, to account. Okay, I have two more questions on Iran. Um, the former prisoners who've been held in uh, uh, jail in Iran went on hunger strike in Vienna, as you know, and Rob Mali issued a statement. They, they wanted basically uh, to make sure that the release of U.S. hostages in Iran is a precondition to negotiation with, with the Iranian regime. Um, the Iranians said they're adamant that that's not going to be linked. So despite your commitment to that, how are you going to um, deal with, with the fact that Iran refused to, to uh, discuss the release of the prisoners and give assurance to their families that you're doing everything to make sure that they are released? Uh, so let me uh, spend a moment just on um, Barry Rosen, one of the former uh, uh, embassy hostages uh, you referenced. Uh, and you heard us welcome uh, the end of uh, Mr. Rosen's hunger strike, and we applaud his heroic efforts uh, to um, secure, to help secure the release of all foreign and dual nationals uh, held by uh, Iran. Uh, this is uh, a challenge that continues to have, to your question, our, our full attention. Um, Barry Rosen, uh, his colleagues, uh, they, are, they are heroes. Um, and that's why uh, Special Envoy Mali uh, met with Mr. Rosen in Vienna uh, and will, of course, meet with him again uh, at any time to hear his important perspective, to, to hear his thoughts. Uh, we are deeply moved by his commitment uh, to the release of those American citizens and third country nationals who were wrongfully uh, detained uh, in Iran. It's a commitment that we completely share. Uh, you heard from the Special Envoy that uh, we are continuing to pursue separate, uh, indirect talks uh, with Iran to secure the release of uh, those who are unjustly uh, held by uh, the regime. Uh, you have uh, heard us make the point that uh, it would not serve our interest, it certainly would not serve the interests uh, of the Americans and third country nationals who are unjustly held in Iran. Uh, to tie their fates to uh, a proposition uh, that is at best uncertain, and that is the proposition of a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, that is a proposition that is at best uncertain. We want the return of Americans and these third country nationals uh, to be a certainty. Uh, that is our goal, to bring them home, to reunite them with their families. Uh, and so, of course, uh, we do not want to uh, have anything uh, unnecessarily uh, stand in the way. So we'll continue to treat these issues uh, as uh, separate uh, uh, as we uh, strive to secure their release. Okay, and one more on Iran. Um, this is any division within the negotiation team in Vienna. I mean, is Mr. Nephew or, um, in agreement with your policy, or it, does he disagree that the way you're handling imposing the sanction on Iran, the way you want to implement it, is different than that of, of Rob Mali and others? Well, I'm fortunate to say that Richard Nephew is still uh, a member of uh, the State Department team. Uh, he no longer serves as uh, the Deputy Special Envoy for Iran, but as you know, a year into uh, an administration, uh, personnel moves are, um, uh, are common. Uh, of course, we're not going to get into the specifics. It's such a sensitive time. It's common for them to leave when they negotiate and 
a deal that is hinged on getting back to this agreement? Well, look, I'm, I'm not going to comment on uh, the specifics of any uh, decision uh, of, of someone to take a step back from a particular account, but you've seen across the administration uh, that, especially at this time, a year into the administration, uh, there have been a number of personnel moves uh, across a variety of fronts, including uh, on high-profile on high profile, uh, issues. Uh, the, the, the fact is, and I think the broader context here, is that uh, the previous administration, um, we've been clear about this, left us with a terrible set of options. Uh, the maximum pressure campaign uh, was an abject failure. Everything that it promised, the opposite <laughs> ended up coming true, whether it was promises of a better deal, whether it was promises of, of a subdued Iran, a cowed set of proxies uh, and uh, terrorist uh, affiliates, uh, whether it was uh, putting uh, the brakes on Iran's nuclear program, whether it was uh, bringing together the world uh, to bring about maximalist demands on uh, Iran. Uh, across all of those areas, the opposite uh, came true. Uh, we inherited uh, an Iranian nuclear program uh, that was galloping ahead, that has continued uh, to gallop ahead, and an Iranian nuclear program that was not subject, unfortunately, uh, to the most stringent verification and monitoring regime ever negotiated, uh, and a verification and monitoring regime that was working, and verifiably so, working according to the State Department, working according to our intelligence community, working according to the IAEA, uh, working according to uh, our allies uh, and partners. So having inherited a very difficult and challenging, terrible even, set of options, we've set about a path that uh, we believe uh, is in our uh, national security interests, and that is a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. It's a, a path that uh, up until now uh, has been in our estimation uh, the best way to, once again, put those uh, stringent, permanent, verifiable limitations on Iran's uh, nuclear program. But we've been equally clear uh, that there will come a day, uh, and there will come a day uh, soon, when uh, the nonproliferation benefits that the JCPOA promised uh, in 2015 and that were implemented in 2016 uh, will be uh, watered down and eroded by the advancements that Iran has made uh, since the last administration left the deal. Uh, in its nuclear program. So uh, right now, we are still um, seeking to achieve a mutual return to compliance, uh, but we're weighing all options and uh, weighing alternatives. Francesco. Very quickly, uh, what happened since yesterday and uh, when the, the foreign minister, Iranian foreign minister, said uh, they were open to direct talks? Have you reached indirectly out to them saying, OK, you're open, we're open, let's do this now and, and, and just meet? Well, I, I wouldn't want to uh, speak to um, anything like that, but you know, it would not take us reaching out uh, for the Iranians to know uh, precisely uh, where we are uh, and what we have uh, long preferred. Uh, we've been very clear. Yeah, just I mean, but just to organize a, an actual meeting. Well, um, we <laughs> again, uh, we have uh, been open to uh, sitting down directly uh, with our uh, allies and partners uh, with the Iranians since this. Uh, began last April, uh, I believe it was. So uh, it is up to the Iranians uh, to make good uh, on that statement. We do believe uh, that it would be more, more productive to uh, engage directly with Iran um, when it comes to JCPOA, when it comes to uh, other issues. Uh, it would also enable more efficient communication, uh, and that is what we need, uh, especially at this moment, uh, when we have precious little time left uh, in an effort to try and salvage uh, or to affect a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. So nothing else happened since yesterday? On that nothing topic. else to uh, announce. Can I go to Egypt real sure. quick? Sure. So uh, uh, back in September, the Secretary made this designation that he was going to withhold, or you would, that the U.S. was not going to spend this $130 million, uh, foreign military financing um, unless Egypt met certain conditions. A couple hours ago, several Democratic Congress people wrote to the Secretary asking him not to certify that those conditions have been met. Um, and I don't know if that such a determination has been met, but I do notice <laughs> that just a few minutes ago, you guys announced $2.5 billion 
in arms sales to Egypt. Is any of that 2.5 billion part of the 130 million in foreign? I mean, that 2.5 billion is astronomically more than 130 million, right? Uh, so Matt, you won't be surprised to hear me say that uh, we don't comment on uh, congressional correspondence. We don't have anything uh, new to announce when it comes to uh, the FMF and the decision that was made in September that you referenced. Uh, what I can say now um, is that we may have more to say uh, in the coming days, but uh, what you've already heard us say um, remains the case that uh, we remain committed to engaging uh, with our Egyptian partners on, on human rights. Okay. Uh, we um, have consistently emphasized that uh, our bilateral relationship would be strengthened uh, by uh, tangible improvement uh, in respect for human rights and, and fundamental freedom. So you can't say whether this 130 million is part of the 2.5 billion? Uh, if we have anything to add on that, we'll get right. back to you. Well, that, I, that, I just want to, what is the point of holding, withholding 130 million in foreign military financing when you're just going to turn around and sell them 2.5 billion in weapons? Matt, if we if we have anything to add on on that uh, on on the report you're referencing, we'll let you know. It's, it's a report. It's an announcement from PM. We'll let you know. Has sure. Egypt made any um, progress on human rights in the last year? I, uh, you know, we have spoken to uh, steps that uh, have been welcomed that we have welcomed, uh, but um, this is a dialogue that is ongoing, uh, and we've consistently made the point. Uh, that, as we have seen progress uh, on individual cases, uh, that um, uh, additional progress across the board uh, would only serve to strengthen our relationship. Uh, our relationship with Egypt uh, is uh, fundamentally uh, important across any number of realms uh, when it comes to uh, regional security, uh, when it comes to counterterrorism. Uh, and so, of course, we would like to see that relation that relationship strengthened even more, uh, and one way to do that is additional progress on human rights. Yes, Andrea. Two more cruise missiles, fifth launch in one week from North Korea. Uh, do you have a new policy to try to get them to answer your messages? Well, not yours personally. Uh, you have heard us speak to our approach to uh, the DPRK. Uh, it is a policy that. Uh, was formulated in the early days of this administration uh, that we uh, developed in close coordination uh, with our allies uh, and partners, especially the ROK uh, and Japan. Uh, we've had a number of engagements with them in the trilateral format, knowing the importance of trilateral co cooperation uh, when it comes to uh, that ultimate goal, and that's the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we, we have also uh, been very clear uh, about uh, our intent. Uh, number one, we have no hostile intent. We harbor no hostile intent uh, towards the DPRK. Uh, we are open to dialogue. We are open to diplomacy. We think dialogue and diplomacy uh, is the most effective means uh, to uh, help us reach uh, that overarching goal, and that's the uh, complete denuclear denuclearization uh, of the uh, Korean Peninsula. Um, if you're referring to the reports overnight, uh, we are still assessing uh, with the ROK in Japan. Uh, those reports, I don't have any further details to add at this time, though. Thank you all very much.